Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be going through 25 different neuroanatomy cases. Now I've tried to choose anatomy that is clinically relevant, that's going to help you in your careers, as well as choosing imaging slices that allow you to gain a better appreciation for where the different anatomical structures lie in relation to one another. For me, in neuroanatomy, there's so much different anatomy crammed into such a small space. And one of the best ways at becoming competent with neuroanatomy is to start realizing where the different structures are in relation to one another. Now, there are 25 questions I'm going to be going through quite fast today, but please pause the uh, video at the different questions, allow yourself time to answer them, look at the images completely, try and figure out the answer, and then join me for the answer as we go along. So we're starting with question one, we asked to label this structure and this is the insular cortex. Now you can see that we're not exactly on midline with the sagittal slice. We've not got our nasal bridge here and we're actually cutting the globe of the eye right through the middle. So we know we're slightly off midline. And uh, I've chosen to include this insular cortex because it's the forgot forgotten lobe. We all know about the frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal lobes. But if I was to put my hand within the sylvian fissure and pull away, I would see the middle cerebral artery running along the border of this insular cortex. And it's a really important uh, piece of anatomy to know, especially when you are looking for signs of acute stroke, which I've done a video for that you can check linked above. So let's go into question two. We asked to label this structure. Now, um, this is the right substantia nigra, and we can see that we are cutting just the top level of our cerebellum here. And this is the classic shape of the midbrain. So we know we're sitting at the level of the midbrain here. And we can see that there are two dark structures here, one anterior and one posterior. The anterior structure is the substantia nigra. Posterior to that, we've got our red nucleus that's in the midbrain. Now, the substantia nigra uh, on uh, a radiological pictures you can't see a difference. It looks like one, one body, but histologically and um, functionally, it's split into the pars compacta and the pars reticularis, which is involved with Parkinson's disease. So another really important anatomical structure to know. Question number three, we asked to label this structure, and this is the head of the chordate nucleus. Now, um, the chordate here, we've got the head of the chordate running to the body and then extending down to the tail. And the chordate um, nucleus runs laterally to the lateral ventricles. The head abuts that lateral surface of the lateral ventricles. And this is part for, uh, one part of the corpus striatum and these uh, deep um, gray matter structures that we need to know about in the brain. The head of the chordate is one that you need to recognize. We often used to seeing it on axial slices. Uh, with the internal capsule coming to the lateral portion of the uh, chordate. Here we've got in a sagittal slice and we can see the shape of that uh, chordate as it's heading backwards. Question number four, we asked to label the structure or more like the sulcus, the space. And this is the left central sulcus, another really important landmark to know uh, when you're assessing uh, MRI scans and CT scans. Now there are multiple ways to identify where the central sulcus is. Most easy on this slice is to look at the midline here. We've got our marginal sulcus here giving us this shape. Uh, some people call it a bracket sign, other people uh, call it a moustache sign. And we know that then the gyrus that's anterior to this um, uh, moustache is our um, post-central gyrus and uh, that is then bordered by our central sulcus. And then our motor cortex is in, in front of that. So we've got our sensory and our motor gyri there. A really important landmark to know. And as we get further up in the brain, that central sulcus gets more and more posterior and often quite difficult to identify. Question number five, we're asked to label this structure. Now we're at the base of the brain now. There's lots of foramina, lots of different things going on. And this is just something that's gonna take time to get to know. I will have a video in the future where I have an actual skull and we're gonna go through all the foramina. But for now, we can just label this foramina, which is the left carotid canal. So we've got our carotid artery coming up through this. And uh, the easiest way to, to remember this is that the posterior to the carotid canal is this jugular spine. Um, it's quite a characteristic spike like that. And if you see that, you know that the carotid is lying anterior to that. Question number six, we're now asked to label a vessel, an artery here, and this is the left posterior cerebral artery. Now we're at the level of the circle of Willis here. We can see our anterior cerebral artery. We can see our MCA is branching uh, left and right, and our basilar artery central, centrally here. And the basilar we know gives off our two posterior cerebral arteries here. They loop backwards like this. 
And then this would, uh, our posterior communicating artery will then link our posterior and our anterior circulation. Core knowledge, the circle of Willis, we need to know at least those uh, main vessels, anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. Okay, question seven, let's label this structure. We can see that it's bright, uh, bright circular structure. Now you may be tempted to say that this is a vessel, but this is in fact the cerebral aqueduct. So this is part of our ventricular system and the cerebral aqueduct links our third ventricle and our fourth ventricle together. We can again see that we're at the level of the midbrain with that shape that we used to here. We can still see the substantia nigra and some of the red nucleus, as well as just the tiny top a superior portion of our cerebellum here and so we know that we're above the fourth ventricle and we're below the third ventricle and this is a classic t2 weighted scan bright csf dark white matter light gray matter and there's our cerebral aqueduct let's go on to question eight we've got another sagittal slice now this is a midline anatomical slice this will come up over and over again in anatomy exams because there's so many important structures that we need to know we asked to label this space here and this is a cisterna magna now, there are multiple cisterns that are house CSF in the brain um, outside of the ventricular system. And this is the largest cistern that we have. We are at the level here of our foramen magnum. And that cistern there that uh, the uh, foramen of Magendi drains into this cistern and magna, this large cistern. Um, so we can see if that space starts to get obliterated, maybe we've got some... Uh, some coning of the brain or some obstructive hydrocephalus high, higher up so we need to see that uh, need to get used to what the cisterna magna looks like here so that we know what it doesn't look like when it's abnormal let's go to question nine another uh, vasculature this one's slightly harder this is another artery that we asked to label and this is the left anterior inferior cerebellar artery now the cerebellar arteries are a bit more difficult to label uh, inferiorly we've got two cerebellar arteries now our vertebral arteries are coming from the posterior as they work their way up to, to form the basilar. So we first start inferiorly and posteriorly. So off our vertebrals, we'll be giving off our posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Then as we're coming up towards our basilar, either off the superior portion of the vertebrals or off the base of the basilar, we'll get this uh, anterior inferior cerebellar artery. And then higher up off the uh, basilar, we're going to get our um, superior cerebellar artery. There's no anterior and posterior there. It's just our superior cerebellar artery. Also, core knowledge, when, we, when we're learning the vasculature of the brain, there are some vessels that you need to know. And this one is a good one to remember. We have our posterior inferior cerebellar arteries and our anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, of which this is one. Question 10, we're racing through it here. We asked to label these structures as a whole, and this is the quadrigeminal bodies. These are the quadrigeminal bodies. So we can see that we are kind of posterior in the brain here. We're cutting our spinal cord, our medulla oblongata. We've got our um, cerebellar peduncles coming here from our pons, and then we're just catching the tectum or the back of the midbrain here. And these are our quadrigeminal bodies that are sitting on our quadrigeminal plates, and they are made up of the superior and inferior colliculi, which are involved with visual, visual and auditory processing and reflexes, um, very important uh, kind of primal uh, reflexes that are involved with these bodies. And these are the posterior portion of the midbrain. Uh, a good landmark to know about, especially when we have our axial planes and we're looking at the cisterns around there. Lots of structures running through this region as well. Question 11, we asked to label this structure. Now this is an MRI where someone's been given gadolini gadolinium and um, we can see that the gadolinium is now um, given us these structures here that we asked to label. And I've, I've included this because people often forget that the cerebellum has nuclei and these this is the largest nuclei in the cerebellum and that's the dentate nucleus it's got fibers running between the dentate and the uh, red bodies uh, and so they're the rubrodento rubrodentate tracks uh, and this is just a reminder that there are actually nuclei within the cerebellum that we need to know the largest of which being the dentate nucleus Question 12, again, we're at the midline, and here this is the fornix, more specifically the body of the fornix. Now we are um, inferior to our corpus callosum, and from the hippocampus, the fornix runs superiorly, anteriorly, and then down inferiorly towards the mammillary bodies, and then runs up into the anterior nuclei of the thalamus. It's a bit of a strange one. People often forget about the fornix. We, we, we 
often see the um, corpus callosum. We know our uh, basal ganglia, but we forget about this fornix running through down towards our mobility bodies. A good one to remember. Question 13, we're asked to label. This is another vessel that we're asked to label, and this is our right internal carotid artery, and the section that we are labeling here is the petrous portion running through the petrous bone. We're catching this um, internal carotid artery in its horizontal plane here. This is when the carotid artery, we previously labeled the carotid canal, it's now come up through that, and now it's running anteriorly in a horizontal plane through the petrous bone before it then extends up into the cerebrum. Question 14, a nice easy one, many of you will get this, but sometimes it's just hard to bring up an anatomical structure, that's why I'm bringing it up here, and this is the false cerebri. So we've got this invagination here of our dura mater, so we've actually got two layers of dura mater here coming together. The falx cerebri is very thick posteriorly. Anteriorly, we've just got a very thin falx that extends downwards towards the ethmoid bone attaching to the cristogalli there. And then our falx cerebri at the back here, we've got our, where it invaginates, it's giving rise to our superior sagittal sinus that's coming across the top here, housing the superior sagittal sinus. Question 15, you may not have seen this imagery before, but this is tractography, where we are highlighting white matter tracks here. And this is what's known as the forceps minor or the anterior forceps, which are really white matter tracks that run from the fr frontal lobe anteriorly through um, the genu or genu of the um, corpus callosum and kind of connect both hemispheres as well as these fibers connect the, the medial and lateral portions of the frontal lobe here. So we've got our forceps minor, that goes to say we have a forceps major, which lie posteriorly, or our posterior forceps. And these are just white matter tracts, anteriorly and posteriorly. The anterior are minor, posterior are major. Larger at the back here, there's much bigger, much bigger tracks running at the back. It's an easier way to remember it. Question 16, another relatively easy one, but sometimes a difficult name to bring up, and that's the septum pellucidum. So we've got this uh, piece of tissue here that separates our lateral ventricles and it's actually two separate um, tissue planes that have uh, abut each other and have a potential space between them and sometimes we can get if i just erase this sometimes we can have separation of those two planes of tissue um, giving a, a cavum septum pellucidum which is just a normal anatomical variant and nothing to worry about when you see it on the scan Let's go to question 17. Again, we're at the midline. We asked to label this structure. We've got this gyrus that we asked to label here. And this is what's called the cingulate gyrus. Now, the cingulate gyrus basically tracks um, like this. We can see coming across here. Um, and what it's involved with is involved with emotional regulation. It's been linked to disorders such as schizophrenia. And it's how we regulate our emotions is very much down to the cingulate gyrus that's running along this like this along our um, corpus callosum like that, mimicking the shape of the corpus callosum. It's got those frontal, uh, frontal lobe things like it, um, emotional regulation, a really important uh, lobe, that's, uh, really important gyrus that's often forgotten about as well. Let's go to question 18. We asked to label the structure. Now this is a really important plane to get used to on a CT scan, and this is our right cerebellar tonsil. So again, we're at the level of the foramen magnum here, and many times in our uh, careers as radiologists, we are going to be asked to assess this area. Have we got signs of raised intracranial pressure, of, of herniation of the brain through the foramen magnum? And we're going to be looking at these cerebellar tonsils here and deciding how far um, they are pushed down into the foramen magnum. And generally, we don't want more than three millimeters to be extending through the foramen magnum. It's a really important structure to know and know what's normal and abnormal. Question 19, just a couple of questions to go. We asked to label this structure. We know it's on the right-hand side, and this is the right trigeminal nerve. So we have our pons here. The trigeminal nerve is the biggest of the um, cranial nerves. Very easy normally to identify on an MRI scan if you've got thin enough slices. The trigeminal nerve is this large nerve that comes, extends anteriorly, extends into Meckel's cave, and it's just a really important nerve to identify. And there's lots of pathologies that can happen along that track. And we want to have a look at these kind of scans over and over again, identify the trigeminal nerve to know what's normal. We just need to see many, many normal scans so that when something abnormal comes up, we can say with confidence that that is abnormal. Question 20, we've got uh, just a couple questions to go here. We've got our 
venous sinuses, blood draining away from the brain. Also, we should be able to label most things on this slide. We asked to label this structure, which is the straight sinus. So we've got our straight sinus coming down here. Now straight sinus joins with our superior sagittal sinus coming down. And what constitutes a straight sinus is our inferior sagittal sinus and our vein of Galen joining to form the straight sinus. That joins with the superior sagittal sinus and then it's drained away by the transverse sinuses into the sigmoid sinus and down into the jugular. So also it's quite simple anatomy, but some people can get confused, especially in the middle here with the vein of Galen and the inferior sagittal sinus and how it all drains back. This is a really good 3D picture to try and get in your mind. Question 21 asked to label this structure. On the CT scan here, we can see we're in the lateral ventricles and this is the right-sided choroid plexus. This is where our CSF is produced. So we were just at the sinuses where CSF by, is getting drained by the arachnoid villi, arachnoid granulations. And here's where our CSF pro is produced in the choroid plexus. And there are a couple of pathologies that can affect this. The majority of the choroid plexus is found in the lateral ventricles. So this is completely normal when you see it like this. Question 22, we asked to label this structure. Now we're actually labeling this dark area here, just like that. And this is the right temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, of the right lateral ventricle. And again, a really important area to know what's normal. Now when we get obstructive hydrocephalus or something like that, we or non-communicating hydrocephalus, this is one of the first areas that dilates. And I've often found that people struggle to visualize the lateral ventricles because we, we're always cutting them in an axial plane and it's quite hard to see what their 3D shape is. And if we were looking at it from the side, we would get our anterior horns of our lateral ventricles like this, our occipital um, horn of the ventricle joining like that, and then our um, temporal horn coming up to join it. So we've just cut this slice here. We're just seeing the temporal horn. This temporal horn is going to uh, extend upwards, join with our occipital horn and give rise to our anterior horn of the lateral ventricles. Just try and get that visually in your head, the 3D shape of these ventricles. Because this, this temporal horn is extending well below the third ventricle, so it's, we're actually at the level of the fourth ventricle here. So we can see it extends quite far down and we often forget that that is lateral ventricle that we're seeing here in the middle, in the middle cranial fossa. Here our temporal lobe is sitting in that middle cranial fossa. Perfect. Question number 23, we're asked to label this structure. Now this may look a bit abnormal to you and that's because it is quite different to a normal image, but this is a normal anatomical variant. This is intraosseous arachnoid granulations. Again, arachnoid granulations are what's resorbing our CSF and uh, then draining that in the venous system away from the, away from the brain. And you can get um, intraosseous arachnoid granulations. This is normal. They still function normally. These are not pathology. These are not lytic bone lesions here. So just to let you know, this is a normal anatomical variant. Two questions left. They're kind of related. We asked to label the three cisterns that are highlighted by this red part. So if it's difficult to see, there are three cisterns. Oh, my drawing. Three cisterns that lie here. Now, I've included this because cisterns sometimes catch people out. It's something that we aren't really taught in med school. I think we often focus on the actual uh, gray and white matter. We focus on the brainstem and the ventricular system and the arterial system, and we forget about these cisterns. So let's go through it here. We have our interpeduncular cistern. So in our midbrain, the front of the midbrain, we've got our cerebral peduncles. And in front of that, we have our interpeduncular cistern between the cerebral peduncles here. So that's quite an easy one to remember, sitting below our mammary bodies, above our pons. Posteriorly, we've got our quadrigeminal plate that we looked at earlier, the tectum of the midbrain. This is the posterior section of the midbrain. Behind that, our quadrigeminal plate gives our quadrigeminal cistern, quite easy to remember. And now remember that these um, cisterns, these two cisterns, will communicate with each other around the midbrain like this. And the CSF that is surrounding this midbrain is part of the ambient cisterns that are connecting our interpeduncular cistern with our quadrigeminal cistern posteriorly. And so we've made it onto question 25. We're asked to label this structure. Now this relates to our previous question. And this is the cere cerebral peduncle that I was talking about, the right cerebral peduncle here. So we have our two cerebral pedun peduncles that then will uh, extend upwards towards the thalami above, uh, superiorly above them. And so we know that this cistern here is our interpeduncular cistern. Okay, so we've raced through 25 questions. I hope you have found these helpful. I hope you've learned something or at least consolidated some of your knowledge. Now, normally these, I normally do 10 questions. I've decided to do 25 this time. 
If you got this far in the video, if you could just take a moment to write in the comments, if you prefer 25 questions, if you would prefer to be 10 questions, if you want 50 questions, 100 questions, I'd like to know what kind of length you guys would like to watch. Otherwise, there are lots of videos to come. I'm trying to make as many as possible as time allows. So I hope you've been enjoying these. I've been really grateful for the people that have reached out to me to say that they're enjoying these videos. It's what helping me to keep making more and hopefully we can just build a bigger and bigger library of videos. So I'm going to stop rambling. I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.